Starting with our first Masterclass live webinar on Thursday, March 14th, international angler and lock carb expert Mike Keady will be explaining early season buzzer tactics. What's the setup? What flies to use? And how to maximize your catch rates? All of this and more, Mike Keady will be explaining. Plus, he will then be answering your questions live during the webinar. And if that's not enough, every attendee will get a copy of Mike's detailed notes and have exclusive access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And for all of this, tickets to the webinar are just €10. Euros. To attend, you must register and pay in advance by going to irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass. I go out, a bit of nymph fishing first, maybe a little olive nymph and a spider pattern or something like that, fish away and then... As soon as something starts to happen, just change straight over. Just change the tip over and put a small dry up. I love that type of fishing. Just fishing's about being relaxed. I've been out with people and they kind of really put too much into it, too much effort into it. The fish will feed if you can get them at the right time and it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time a lot of the times. Hello and welcome to the Ireland on the Fly podcast about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. For this week's episode, we're joined by Jimmy Tyrrell, the well-known fly tire based outside Abbey Leaks in Leash. Jimmy talks to us about his fly fishing and fly tying journey, from tying flies he could fish with on his local rivers, to supplying shops and customers as far afield as Australia. And for those of you who want to know the perfect way to mix your dubbing, it involves a Chinese takeaway carton and an air canister, so do stick around for that one. But before we hear from Jimmy, Tom, there's been some nice fish caught in carb, I believe, in the opening days. Yeah, there's been a couple of really nice fish caught out. Anybody who's on social media, see Jasper Matthews, a lovely fish, in around 16, 16 pounds. Uh, Carb, it's been mild. Now, I haven't got out. I've suffered from tailing COVID. From man flu, So I actually haven't been out yet. No, 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 no. Man, it's not that serious. I've had man flu. Oh, I was lucky (laughs) to pull out of it. (laughs) Jesus, I was very lucky to pull out of it. This is only COVID. (laughs) Man flu. Whoa. So, (laughs) So I actually haven't gone out, but I, I've been chatting to a lot of the blokes been out. Uh, Cara's been fishing, well, not to fly, more the, the, the Shan Balach, as we call around here, which is the old style, which is uh, trolling the brick in. Big tradition of that, always in the Cara. I mean, I think I've said to you before, years ago when there was professional fishing fleets on Cara, that's that's how they fished it. When they fir- when they banned netting and longlining on the Cara back in the late 1800s, uh, what the professional fishermen did was they resorted to fishing in small punts with three rods baited with uh, brickings, which are small minnows. So yeah, it's still a good tradition of that done here. Some not, some nice fish coming out of it. I've heard of another double figure fish as well caught in it. Um, yeah, it's funny. And we were talking about this and I do a bit of it. I, I think there's a lot more scope for lure fishing this time of year. And to a certain extent, it is done, but probably could be done more by using your minkies, uh, humongous as I've I've had a lot of luck in the last couple of years and I've reverted back to that more for the first couple of weeks here I used to do a bit of trolling as well just to get out and uh, but um last two seasons I've concentrated way more on fishing minkies and humongouses and it, it does do well now as well then you look I mean mask has fished quite well as well but mask has fished much better to fly now, it's probably one of the reasons to that, I'd say, is guys who have gone out of mask have actually gone out fly fishing. Whereas a lot of the guys that have gone out of car, they'll do their bit of trolling for the first couple of weeks. And then maybe when the duck fly gets up, that's when they'll resort to fly. But um, mask, like on the opening day, I've heard of some n- nice catches. Not 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 huge, not huge catches, but, you know, good, decent fish caught. Um, and interesting, across a bit of a mix, you're, 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 your sort of shrimp type dabblers, which would be your fiery brown dabbler, your hair's ear dabbler, but also as well the humongous and the minkies. Interesting. So, you know, they'll take them there. Yeah, I've, I've had some really good fishing on mask as well early in the season, fishing um, minkies and humongous. And when I like another thing as well, with regards to the minkies, like guys think uh, they come with them and I see them, they're on size six, long shanks, size eight, long shanks. No, I, I, I dress them. I dress them on a size 10. Really? Kind of small. Oh, yeah. And it still I mean, does the job. You, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a um, little plug in there for Fully Mill uh, Baffins. Now, they're, they're macro. They're micro rabbit strip. Uh, it's perfect. If you don't have um, 
you can use mink or but the rabbit strip is lovely and it's cut really thin so it goes lovely on a size 10 um yeah and i think you can go too big i mean i know from trolling the bricking i know from putting the brick you don't always put a big bricking on or a big minnow you know traditionally how deep so, do you need to and, get and, and same because like you see this is, see what struck me it's all right is when i saw the picture the the 15 16 pounder try it right mm. that was caught trolling yeah. i went there's fish there that size that you you know mm. it just opens your eyes to the fish that are there yeah. so my next question then is right how can you get them on the fly well i don't know how jasper caught his uh, what um what method he was actually using I, I think it was trolling but i don't know what you know was he targeting bigger fish or whatever but let's say for example and, and the bricking does catch big fish um you, you you're trolling unweighted behind you on a mount so you're not down deep. Mm. So as a consequence of that, like I have, I've gone my lure fishing at the start of the season. And initially, when I started, when I was trying out first, I used to go with a DI seven and a DI five, and it's tough work doing that for the day. And you know, it wasn't great. And I reverted back to a fast intermediate, and way more success, way more success. Is it they're willing to come up to it? Yeah, I think so. Also, as well, where you can, this is very much so, Matt, position it where it can't be that far from the fish. Mm. So what I mean by that, okay, try limit your drifts where you're over 20 foot of water and you, you know your fly is only one foot below the surface. So let's say there's a trout hug in the bottom there, down at 20 feet. Um, you know, is he going to go 18 feet to get one? No, he's not. But if you concentrate and, and you target areas of shallows where you're, you know, you can see a scary beside you, and it just goes down to four feet. So if your fly is one foot in you know, the surface in that area, a trout doesn't have to travel as far. Are the fifteen so, pounders you know, going to be there though? No, fifteen pounders aren't. They wouldn't necessarily unlikely they'll be in the four foot water, but they'll be in drop offs, right? They'll still be in drop offs early in the season. They're going to be in foraging on smaller fish. Depends where the smaller fish are going to be, okay? Uh, but they're going to have to target them. So let's say if there's a drop off going from three foot down to 12 foot and there's a shoal of smaller fish there, um, uh, some stickleback, they don't target stickleback as much because they're that bit smaller, but let's say there's fry there, okay? Some coarse fry. I mean, that's what they've got, that, that's what they've got to target. So they'll come in there. So let's say you're on that drop off and you're only a foot or two foot below. Yeah. Kill, you know, you never know, could surprise you. There's a bit of working on that and, and, and judging where you're going to fish. Yeah, see, it just struck me that, like, because when you were talking about the kind of the culture of trolling early season on Carob, which mm. is there, and Neil O'Shea spoke about it on Koran as well. Mm. Yeah. I kind of compare it to, I think, as well, um, on the rivers for salmon fishing early season, traditionally, it was spinning. Yeah, you were sa- we were saying that, yeah. But yeah. because now of the development of tackle and lines, shooting headlines and skagit lines, there's now more of a movement towards you actually don't need a spinning gear anymore that you can actually use the fly rod all year round. Yeah. So I'm just, so, and people are actively doing that now. So I'm just wondering, is there more kind of like, if you can get to that kind of mindset change, people are willing to kind of maybe try out new things with tackle and lines. And like you said, it doesn't have to necessarily be as deep or doesn't have to be as big as the lure. You can actually finally ditch in a few years time trolling and actually be out all season yep. long with the fly rod and t- and and be actually targeting those 15, 16 pound ferox trout. Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Now, the only thing I would say, and trolling will always have this advantage is the amount of ground you can cover. Yeah. But, okay, you know, but, but the flip side of that is you think of Neil O'Shea and he talks about Quran and how they target the early spring salmon over the lies. Yeah. yeah um, and, and again, it was interesting what you were saying about there, just reminding me of salmon fishing, spring salmon fishing. You got to find where the fish are, and you got to put the fly near it because they're not going to move yeah. that far. So it's the yeah. same principle. They'll hold. They'll hold in lies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh no, no. I mean, like it's true. The only thing is, as I said though, because with the with the trolling, you can cover so much more ground. And I'm kind of thinking on that as well because I'm trying to devise. Um, watch this space, folks. I am trying to devise a method where I can target uh, ferox on the fly. Yep. Okay. Uh, on the lake uh, coming up with different ideas at the moment and everything but I just know big draw because I used to years ago I used to do the ferox fishing uh, but it's been taken to another level now by the predator guys when I did it back uh, I was talking to Neil about it there 
when we had them on. Like I, I did it in the noughties. I had some success in it. I did find that you just you're covering so much more ground. And I do realize that with, you know, when I'm gonna if I do crack it on on the fly, that I'm really gonna have to find specific spots, you know, and, and hound them. Yeah, but surely that that is the the answer. It's a bit like bass marks in the ocean. Oh yeah, completely. Find yeah. find yeah, where completely. they are, you know, find yeah. b- based on the conditions. Based on yeah. the temperature, based on the mm. depth, find where the lies are, and uh, and that's it. Go. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, uh, for once again, it's time. It's time <laughs> to get doing. I mean, some of the best time for ferox fishing I used to often find was March and April, and like I'm flat out, I'm flat out guiding guys. You just want to, you know, catch your pound and a half, two pound fish. But I tell you, that I'm very happy. Ferox on the fly, oh, yeah. and if you're catching 15, 16 pounders on the fly, yeah. I tell you, that would be. Yeah, you want to. You might want to go up a bit from a five weight. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Be a whole new ball game. Yeah, yeah. the well, traditionalists will be tearing with, their hair out. <laughs> oh, tearing the hair out, tearing the hair out. But um, yeah, look, I I want to do put a bit of time into it. It won't be pretty. It will not be pretty. Like definitely won't be five weight. But look, I'd li- I'd like to do it. Yeah, I'd like to do something it. different. Something yeah. different. Yeah. Mm. Well, look, let's get back to this week's episode anyway, uh, and Jimmy Tyrrell. And um, I first asked Jimmy about his plans for the coming season. I'm hoping the rivers are going to get better and the fishing is going to get better <laughs> right. because it, it isn't great, is it? it? Wasn't last year wasn't a good year. The rivers have deteriorated a little bit. Clubs are disappearing along the rivers because it was kind of an old agenda. The younger people don't seem to be getting into it. As you know, go back. 20, 30 years ago, there was all older people, older people that done a lot of fishing, so they kept these clubs going. Along here now, there's Abilix, there's no club in Abilix where I am. There's no club in Mount Draft. You have to go to Duro then and further down, which is, it's a pity because the more people that's on the rivers, the more people can keep an eye on things. Very true, actually. We had Dave O'Donovan on um, from Cork, and he was saying the same, Tom, wasn't he, just in terms of just the older guys are kind of keeping the club going, like, you know, because he was saying how few members, you know, that you, you'd go down to the Function or the Auberg and there wouldn't be that many lads fishing there, like, you know, even though it's incredible fishing. I, I got a message off a guy down in um, the far side of Kilkenny, down towards Craig the Manor, and he actually told me, he ran the IFI, he found a net between the spans of the bridges on the River Barrel there during the week. You know, so that'll tell you, and the rivers are closed at this side but that's what's going on all along yeah yeah and the anglers are the custodians aren't they jimmy yeah well that's what i'm saying the more people we get on the rivers the more people keep an eye on things and mm. up, up this end there's nobody fishing so tell us where's your local rivers and where did you grow i'd have the nor here but i'd go down the far side of ballyraga towards kilkenny right you move for you. You'd go further down a bit for the fishing, would you, Jimmy? Well, it's it's a personal thing to me because, like, up this end, you're climbing over ditches and fences, and and I've found stretches down there which are out of this world. And I mean, right. there's cattle on them to keep the banks down, and there's you can cross the river, and that's on the north. Now it's this this fantastic water just below Ballyragget, right? And it's only twenty minutes from here, so I can just jump in the car, head down, and it's. It's it's a special place now, and again, you don't see anybody on it. I won't mention the club, no. <laughs> right, but it, it is no. a club water. You can tell us afterwards, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, I will give us the quarter. Take it over there if you're ever passing. <laughs> There's another little river that. Well, I have the 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 Urkna as well. The Urkna is lovely. I've got to. Fi- I've fished the. I fished the Urkna. Yeah. A uh, good few years back. It's a beautiful river. Yeah, it's a really really brilliant kind of limestone river and used to be fantastic fishing on it. Again, access is gone because culture's changed and farming has changed. A lot of these banks are getting fenced off now. You're not to say bank erosion. I think it's having the opposite effect actually because the banks are not being, they're just getting overgrown and swallowing up the rivers. But um, that's the way it is now. And so you've no access. That's why I travel. Now, the River Gowl as well. I don't, I don't know whether you fished that, Tom. I've never fished it, but I was told about it when I was fishing the Urkna. But Absolutely. I, yeah, it's meant to be beautiful. Yeah, it's but it's Dara, a tributary you, you, of the Urkna. It, it flows into the Urkna. Yeah. Dara, you've you got to fish the, just to see the Urkna. It's I remember special. Getting, 
I got skunked by a fish, but I would have put him at three pounds. I didn't really get skunked. I just couldn't entice him. Yeah. I, threw, I chucked everything at him. Uh, it's at least a I didn't special rhythm. Him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to fish that, Jimmy, you used to have to get a, a day ticket there. Just yeah, from Durham. Below the bridge. Yeah, the yeah. Durham, Durham is, that still, was. is that still the case? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, like then I think you go up to or, as far as Erlingford, but I, I don't think there's any clubs up that end either now. So Durham sure. have it up as far as Culler Hill, say, which is maybe four, five miles of a run. But there's miles and miles of water in it. Yeah. And it's all lovely. It's, real, it's like happy. a little chalk stream, really. Oh, yeah. It, it's fantastic. And the, and I also fished the, the stretch of the Nor where the Urkna runs in below. And that was beautiful. And uh, I actually fished it on a, on a falling falling uh, flood and the fish just turned on. I was actually, uh, I was there with uh, Peter Driver was with me. And uh, yeah, oh, it was just fantastic fish. The gal would probably be my favourite because once you get good access to it, you can walk miles and miles. And... It's not very big. It's not a very wide river, is it? No, it's not. No, no. Uh, if it was 20 foot wide in places... Maybe, you know, that's about it. You'll get yet, wilder stretches and pools, but I mean... And yet it can still hold quite, it can still hold quite decent trout, can't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, I didn't fish it at all last year. The weather and everything, like, if you don't get it early in the year, before, say, June or July, then it just weeds up and it's hard fish. But it's still fishable, like so. But again, access, if you don't know the ways into it, that's why people don't fish it. I had um, I done uh, an article with Mike Weaver, right? Trout and salmon. Did you ever hear of that guy? Yes, yes, I've yeah, seen yeah, 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 yeah. And he they, he booked me for two days. He didn't. Uh, the fisheries board and I brought him up through Peter O'Reilly, actually, Lord of Mercy on him. God but I took him out for two days on it, and he done an article, fantastic article, and try, and it, the the article was what a difference a day makes because the first day. It was real windy and there was nothing much happening. The second day, there was a massive hatch of blue winged olives on it. And he had super, super fishing on it. So he went away happy, a happy man. He fishes, see, he, where he's from, he fishes that type of river, small streams. Yeah, where is he from and again? He's the north of somewhere down south of it, kind of De- Devon, Cornwall, that area, I think. Right. So. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I remember that article now that you mention it. Actually, yeah, yeah, it was a, a br- it was he, he really wrote yeah. it. It was a great article. Man. Yeah, but it was just the way he, that he worded it. I wasn't expecting that, but it was what a difference a day makes, and it was the truth because he got some really good trout on it. It's a bit of an untapped jewel, isn't it? Where you are there, Jimmy, yeah. like with all those rivers, you know, is you don't hear much about it. You like you said, there's not many clubs, there's not fish much, but it's you don't see them there. I was down in um, I I got the the free. Pass now, travel pass for all of to do. And uh, I took the kids down to the grandkids down to Limerick shopping Christmas. And I just looked at all the small rivers that you're going over there. They're, they're all unfished, like, and there's some as big as the Gowl, some most of them down around Tipperary. Now, there has to be some real hidden jewels that people don't fish, you know. So I'm going to try and give that a bit of a scout this year if I can, because I want to get as much fishing as I can. <laughs> the years are going by. But you got to get out the Peter O'Reilly book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Peter was brilliant. Now he's, he was a good friend of mine. He was he was good to me actually. Another yeah. man that I met through you know through the museum as well through contacts and things like that. Since you mentioned the museum, Jimmy, maybe just remind us um, about the Irish Fly Fishing and Game Museum that is there. Um, maybe just give us a bit of background. People mightn't be aware of it. I start, I'll mention this man, and I, yeah, you can mention many, because he was one of the main, he really was good to me. He's set me up in that place, a man called Joe Hosey. He's big, a big fly fisherman, and, and, but a, a gentleman. And he asked me, would I go out there and have a look at this place? When I went out, it was very little in it now. It was kind of, but it went from that to, he done all the work in it, He's a great pair of hands. He's a gifted carpenter with no qualifications, right? But he's gifted. He really done that place up from an old derelict farmhouse into a museum. And he did it all himself, like. Where is this, Jimmy? It's basically off from Duro. When you were on the main Kilkenny Road out, coming outside of Duro, it's a little place called Atana. And it's well signposted. And it's approximately... 
maybe a three mile outside of Durham. And that's it. And it's well signposted. A town is well signposted. Again, the museum isn't well signposted. You know, you've, you've got past the signs before you'd see them. And so basically, Joe Hosey had this idea to do, set up a... He actually, he said he found all fishing reels in in the somewhere in the, in the wall and I kind of sowed the seed in his head and it went from that. But he got an awful lot of... Basically, everything he got in it was sponsored. Then he started buying and selling and, you know, antique fishing tackle, which probably, what, 20-odd 20, 20 years ago, there might have been a bit more around then. And he had dealers coming there from England buying stuff and stuff. So that's how he built it up. But he got massive, massive donations. Even from the National History Museum, he got some fantastic, really old glass cases and, you know, so, but a lot of people were good to him. And I, the one thing I will say, he did, he done a fantastic job on it. You would have to go and see it to believe if you looked at it off the main road, or if even if you go into the least tourism or least tourism board, right, and just type in Irish game fishing and shoot museum, mm. and it's, you'll see the front, and it just looks like an old house, right? An old farmhouse. That's what it looks like. But it goes back and he's built onto it, and it's, it's a special place. To me, it is a special place that people should be able to go and see. Well, we must actually, uh, Tom, there's an idea for an episode. We must go down and talk to him and visit it maybe and you should. do an interview. Yeah. And, and even do an interview with him yeah. because, like, like I said, it is somewhere that needs to be seen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that I think that'll be good. That's another one, Sarah. <laughs> another episode. You, in all fairness, Jimmy, we even find it hard to get the ones to do the ones where we actually go fishing, which you yeah. think we jump at. Right? Seriously, but we're, yeah. we're kind of pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> we organize all these trips everywhere. If we, yeah. did, I think we got to, we did one trip last year, uh, yeah. out of about 20 that we said we'd do. But no, <laughs> no, seriously, something like that actually genuinely, I mean, to be honest with you, the fishing trips are kind of really for us. Well, but you something... can make a fishing trip down here, can't you? Come down yeah. and do fish it. Actually, and, now. And do now that in the one thing. Oh, you'd and I'll show you around them rivers. Yeah. No problem Every at time, all. Because sometimes I use that road still when I'm on the road. And I just love coming into Duro. And I'll just, I, quite often I'll actually stop. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop just there after cross the bridge and walk up and just look down yeah. the bridge. Because even in the town, geez, even the stretch below the bridge, you just yeah, it's lovely, look at it and it? go, yeah. oh, I just, I just want to chuck yeah. a fly out and, there. It's and gorgeous. there's plenty of fish in here. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so and there's a lovely and there's a lovely little pub on the other side of the road, the bridge yeah, there. Bob's bar. Bicycle on the wall. Bob's yeah. bar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jimmy, and just before when you were mentioning the fly fishing um museum, you mentioned Peter O'Reilly. Um yeah. I had the pleasure as well of meeting Peter a few times and did inter- I did one of the last interviews, I think, with him even. Yeah. Um and an incredible man, incredible influence, the stories, wow. the influence he had on Irish fly fishing is just amazing, isn't it? And, and a gentleman, I, yeah. I really was a gentleman. I had a great time. I, I actually, I done a frame. I, I done a fly in his name called the O'Reilly Shrimp, and I put it into a, I put it into a frame, and I done a really. I was I was proud of with a picture of him in it, and I went up and with um, who did I go with now? Arthur Greenwood, I think. Yeah, and the two of us went up up to the house, and I presented it to Rose. Oh, I give it to her and she was crying her eyes out and she sent me back a lovely card and I was so nice but I wanted to do something for him because he was good to me now and he, he was genuinely lovely. was and it wasn't for anything that I could give him so he was very helpful to a lot of people I think yeah he was he was an absolute gentleman I have been putting one of his copies on Locks of Ireland but for the last issue uh, he actually got on to me uh, he needed some information so he got on to me and I, I just gave him the information. I think he rang me, whatever. But um, I got a letter from him thanking me for the contribution. And I have it in the book. And it's, it's, it's really nice to have. It's just lovely, you know. But that's the way he was. He was an absolute gent, you know? Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. really yeah, a, he was a great so time nice. for him. Yeah, lovely man. But the work he's, ethic as well. He's missed. Incredible. Oh, like, like I remember asking him to like to detail the amount the strata you know the routine he used to go through to write those books it was so disciplined mm. so committed like you know like what he did for ice fly fishing in terms of just just putting that information down you know because i can't see anybody ever surpassing it like. 
No, I can't because I, I don't know how many books I have belonging to him actually. And he did quite a few of them, you know, all the remodeling and all the rejigging and different ones because everything changes, as you know. It does, yeah. But, you know, I mean, to be honest, and I've said it here before in the show, I mean, the locks of Ireland, to me, when I got my first car, that was my Bible. That was, you know, that was, you know, dog eared and everything and just plucked through of all the places I went to. But it's like what you said there, Dara. Never really thought, you know, the, the work that I actually had to go into that. Yeah. And that's just one of the books. Because uh, yeah. there was very little wrong in, you know, there was nothing, anything, if you wanted no. to know any information on anywhere in the country, mm. you just had to go into one of his books. And it was neat. Everything was spot on. Even this yeah. end of it, the gaol and all the people along the rivers that he mentioned. And, you know, so he, there was some unbelievable amount of work yeah. that had to go on to get all that information. Yeah. Yeah. And it's only when they're gone, you kind of appreciate <laughs> In yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. But that's his legacy. He's left a lot yeah. of stuff behind him for people yeah. to, yeah, yeah. You know. here, here. Um, Jimmy, so tell us, how did you get into fly? Now we we'll go go into the past. Now, now we we'll start with the how did you get into fly fishing and give us a bit of that background. I go back uh, when I was a child, really. Probably might have been five, six, seven, eight. I can't actually remember. But my grandmother bought a book, and there was all salmon flies in it. You know, the real old class, and it was a real colourful, lovely small book. And that always stayed up here somewhere because I was brought up with the uncles that done a lot of fishing, not fly fishing now, fishing for food. Fishing. <laughs> yeah, simple. yeah. And, uh, and that always stayed with me. And I'm from South Wales originally. And right. I moved over. My father's from Abbey Leaks. And we moved over. Me and my, my wife's parents are from Dundalk. So we all moved over back in late 70s, 80, 1980. So we're here 40 odd, a lifetime nearly now. But and did your dad move back as well with you? Yeah, my father came back after a while. Right, lovely. And then he passed away now, Lord of Mercy. So right. I've been here definitely 45, six, seven years probably. No, I, don't, I can't remember it's how long now, but all my family is all grown up. And when I was probably about 20, 21, and the Rivers, I always wanted to get into fly fishing and stuff like that. And no better place because the river's on your doorstep. And then I, it started, I was working and I, I don't know how I got, really got into it. I always remember the first fly that I tried was a partridge and orange, right? And I think that actually got the bug because I probably got my first fish on that fly. And then we'd work and then had a family and... It became, I started tying a few for myself and then somebody else asked me and one thing led to another then and I had a good job and I was used to do shift work so I was able to <laughs> do a, a lot of learning when I was on nights. And like that. You can say and that then, now, Jimmy. Yeah, say no, it now. But, uh, they're all gone. She's, she's an American that owned it. She's, she's gone long ago. <laughs> I hope she's listening. <laughs> if you want, we can edit this out. No, no, no leave it in. <laughs> so, for anybody who's listening, if you want to become yeah. an expert fly tire, get a night shift. <laughs> get, a, get a good job, yeah. And, and it was, it was, I used to, do, I had a really good job in it. I had a fantastic job. And I used to just be in the office tying flies. If I was needed, I got a call. And it was wow. one of them jobs. It was nice. There but, wasn't um, too many calls. Yeah. Was there? And, <laughs> and then I started to tie a few more and a few more. And then I wound it up that I was able to subsidize my wages then. I'd make a few quid on the side with my wages. And there was a couple of shops in Kilkenny, which I won't mention now, but there was only two anyway. So we know. <laughs> and uh, I used to tie flies for them. Right. Not a lot, but just enough to give me a, a, a few an extra few quid every week. And then it just went from one thing to another. Then I was tying a few for lads here, there, and I just. So there, can, can I just uh, this is kind of almost random out of the blue. Yeah. What was the most popular pattern that you sold in the shops back then? Just want to know, like that. That'll be a couple of years back. So yeah. What was the most uh, popular pattern? Years, they were yeah. for the rivers, hares ears, uh, right. pheasant tail nymphs, all the old fast green mouth glories, and, you know. Stuff like that. Yeah. Now, what size is 14s? 14s and 16s. For the, dry, right. for the small dries, it'd be 16s. Right. You wouldn't hear tell of an 18 then. It was 16 no. would no. be the smallest. 
and you right. go up to sometimes for sedges and stuff like that, you could go up to eight. You know, now right. that's come that's okay. gone completely down the scale now. You've gone to twenties and you know that's the way it is now. So but and that was it, and you had the, and you, I, you had them in the two shops in Kilkenny. Huh? Yeah, I used yeah. to do the two shops in Kilkenny. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't mean mass production now. It was just that he'd uh, the man would ring me up. I won't mention it. <laughs> I, he's dead now, actually. But uh, he'd ring me and he'd say, Jimmy would be able to do me X amount. And he'd probably give me a couple of months' notice. So I was able to mm. just do one. I'd take over what I had then. And I used to supply him and I used to supply another lad down there as well. Yeah. Again, we won't mention names. Right. Because <laughs> he might want to be here that I was time flies with him because he buys himself. Okay. So if he hears this, he'll know who he is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, you're not scared about the American woman hearing you at all. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be upsetting anybody anyway, Tom, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I wouldn't. But uh, yeah. no, that's... And then I think I was doing that. And then what happened? I set up a little website. And I was doing a bit. And I used to get I used to get fantastic help from, from Joe Hosey, who was the, he was in the committee of the NAIGC. And I used to get invited all over the country to game fairs, free stands. And a, another man that I'd lo- love to mention, and he's dead now, Lord of my son. He was one of the Philip Lawton. I don't know whether they ever remember him. He I worked do, for Countryside actually, yeah. Ireland. Yeah, I do. Yeah. He done an, an awful lot for me now. Personally, he yeah. was a, became a great friend and he died too young, but he was a, a gentle, gentle man, a lovely man. I had a great time mm. for him. But he did he did a lot for me. No, he used to give me a free stand up at the Irish Angling Show. Right. Years ago, which was worth a lot of money then. And I wouldn't have been able to afford a stand, didn't it? But and then you know that's how you get. You have to you have to basically get up off your backside and get out there and try and. Around, and by yeah. getting around there, that's how people got to know you. Like I would have heard, I would I would have heard of you years back, well over twenty years, Jimmy. And it would have been, I think, I might have seen you at a couple of shows. But I know from lads we'd be talked to, uh, you know, I I I get my flies from Jimmy, you know, and you know, and I love glad to tell you as well, Jimmy, that I've caught plenty of fish on flies that you type. So yeah. I, I can vouch for them here. So, yeah. well, so I love experimenting with good, patterns as you, well. Different. You, you know. do good lake flies as well. Not yeah, just river I, flies. I, did, yeah. I hope you got a few on them ones you got last year. Yeah, the, them ones. Oh, I love the way he says they had them ones, and we won't elaborate any further. <laughs> 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 I did actually. Yeah. And I, okay, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag a little bit as well. I actually gave it to somebody to dap one day, and they caught on it as well. Okay. Now. And they got fish so, with it dapping. They did, yeah. They did. Well, yeah. I got. I actually got a nine pound fish on Corrib three years ago, dapping that fly as well. That's the gods on the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I well believe it sits up lovely, yeah. but it's lovely dry. It's a dry May. Yeah. One of, and, it's one of Jimmy's patterns. Uh, it's a beautiful pattern. Yeah, it's just so I don't know. It's some you know, something gets in your mind and you just make it up and you as you're going along. And but uh, yeah. when stuff I saw like that, that I love first, doing stuff like that. Yeah, you know, when I saw that first, or oh, the one thing just came into my mind, I said, I've got to have that. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> well, Peter got him to you anyways. So yeah, he did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know. You're, you're welcome to more, Tom. Don't worry about that because they don't last too long. No, I'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, Jimmy, did you find then, as you were tying, as you were getting in more in demand, that you were fly tying more than fly fishing? That one took over. Yeah, and it was really. Um, that was the one reason somebody offered me a job in Port Leash in Enver, an environmental place, and I, I couldn't turn it down. But then the, the trouble was then I had about 12 years of tying, coming home from work, tying, coming home from work, tying. And it was that, that I found that tough because I wasn't getting as much fishing as now I get yeah, up in yeah. the morning and I go out and I tie flies every day, six, seven days a week if I want, if I don't. I don't have to. I enjoy it now, and I enjoy teaching it and taking people out. You know, doing all that. I enjoy the the teaching more so than the tying, but they 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 go hand in hand. I I actually love tying flies anyway because I I enjoy it now because there's no pressure. 
yeah, yeah. no pressure that's it exactly like. I, I think I think in all fairness Jimmy you you really you have to enjoy it if you're going at it uh, in any way even commercially you really have to enjoy it because you know um you, you, and you have to be quite disciplined as well to, to you know to sit down and, and to set yourself you know that you have to say let's say two dozen Greenwell's glories yeah know? yeah but I don't tie commercially for shops now I only no, no. I yeah. just set yeah it's only through the website for yeah just for customers and, and I send them all over the world I've tied I've tied thousands of flies for the Australian fly fishing team ladies oh, and gentlemen yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of flies for Tasmania and places like that. Yeah, I've tied Excellent. a lot. Yeah, I met. I, I, well, I didn't meet this guy. Glenn Eggleton is his name. He's over the Australia's was big into the Australian fly fishing uh, teams, and his wife is over the ladies one. And mm. I've tied a lot. I tied a lot of flies for them last year. They were in Ireland, were they? I think it was Ireland or somewhere like that. And uh, yeah, I've tied a lot of flies for them over the years, and I, I get great orders from them. But they always give me six months, and you know. They give me plenty of notice. So, do you do you still get the orders like uh, on a Friday night? I need them for Saturday morning at ten o'clock. <laughs> yeah, no. I have it, I'm, <laughs> on the website, it says it, it says seven days. <laughs> yeah, you do. Hey, you, you do. You get the odd ones of them, Tom. <laughs> to God, yeah, but hey, if I wouldn't say anybody's stuck either, if there was genuine. But you do get people. I get a lot. I get a, a lot of flies to copy actually. Mm. I've had an awful lot of business out of Killarney last year and, and again started again this year because lads down there seem to have a lot of their own patterns, right? So I have I got a lot of stuff last year and they're, they're starting to come back to me again this year. Yeah. So I do, a, it's not a big deal to copy a fly anyway once you have the material. So it's yeah. not, a, not a major headache. But again, they give you always like a couple of dozen of this, a couple of, because they're, they're buying for maybe a bunch of them. So it's not give me one of this fly, two of that fly, and you know you, you'll get them in the couple of dozen that of a single pattern. You know, I I've got to tell you my story of copying a fly now. Now that you mentioned it to me, okay, <laughs> I don't know what I tell you, there. And anyway, there's a guy here that I fish with called Jimmy Malloy, Jimmy Pa, and he go, he goes, he was coming back from fishing one day, and he stopped in front of me, and he goes, he goes, I'm after catching five great trout on a hatch of olives. He said, yeah, and I got four of them on one fly. I said, whoa, what do you have it? Now, Jimmy doesn't tie flies, and it was, Rod was on the rod holder of the car. And he showed it to me, and I said, gee, that's a nice fly. He said, whoa. He said, yeah. He says, I don't know where I got it. I think I got it from an English lad last year. He said, do you have any more? And he goes, no, I don't. He says, that's why I've stopped. He says, I says, uh, is there any chance you'd be able to copy it? And I looked at it, and I went, geez, the, the, the body fur media. I said, look, I don't know. And you, you, there's no name on it. Oh, he says, no, no name on it. Said, Look, leave it with me. I said. Yeah. So I went in. He went off, and he says, "I said, are you going fishing tomorrow?" He says, "I am." All right. Look, I'll have it ready for you in the morning. So I got it, and I had it with a magnifying glass and everything. I was looking at the fur, and I go, "I don't have that color." So I started blending. Jesus. Now it, it was winged with a sort of yeah. a, a blay wing, right? Right. The, the, the color of the body was it was an off olive, but anyway. I got it as close as I did. I, you get mixed I, it oh up. yeah, I was I was happy with that anyway. So I tied four of them and kept two for myself and two for Jimmy into a little camel sandbox uh, and fly back. And I rang him and said, "Look, I have to go to town. I have to go to Ballon Road today. Look, fly's going to be an under stone on the pillar." And he said, "Sound." I collected anyway. So <laughs> off he goes, and I even I don't know about an hour and a half later, I get this phone call, and he goes, "I said, did you get them?" I did, he says. I did. I got them. And he says, I have a name for them. Oh, he says, what, what's the name? Jedward. <laughs> and I went, what? <laughs> Jedward? Yeah, do you know, like, they're twins, but they don't look like one another. He <laughs> 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 was quick, wasn't he? <laughs> 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 so, he was to say, it was a it was a while before I tied another fly for Jimmy. He didn't catch any trout on that one, though. He never told me. Jesse had some wit, didn't he? And Jimmy, tell us, were you entirely self-taught? Yeah. 
So how did you learn? I Just was. books? Yeah. I actually was because there was nobody where where, where I'm situated here now, and there's very, very few fly fishermen that my fly tires. So mm. and and then there was no Davy McPhail's videos, which are absolutely superb now. And a lot of other videos out there as well. There's some yeah. Well, he was the one that kind of brought that thing online and he did some job here to give him credit. You really so, did actually, yeah. The, but no, it was all through books and through... And wh what books did you find good, actually, now that, now that we're talking about them? Can you remember, or was it just a mishmash? Yeah, but, but a lot of them. But the main one would have been O'Reilly's book back then, you know, yeah. Trout Flies of Ireland, because yeah. he used to get a lot of late people fishing Corrib at that time. Even here, there was a good few fishermen in Abbey Leaks used to fish Corrib, but yeah. they may and then they wouldn't fish again, even on a river. That's the right. way they were. They just go up for the Mayfly for two or three weeks and then back to back to the grind. But it was mainly that was probably one of the books. And then I had other ones from I can't even think of the names. I had a couple of other ones for the small dry flies from English and a dictionary of trout, fly, trout flies. That was probably one of the main ones. Mm. And then there was O'Malley's, which one was that? There was two or three books that I still use to this day. And O'Reilly's is a great one if you if there's a pattern in it. But you'd need, I'd kneel an arm off by hand at this stage. <laughs> but um, there was the English one. A Dictionary of Trout Flies was really a good, a good one as well. Yeah. We had everything in that. And another thing then, how did you get, out, how did you get for materials then? Where, where were you getting your materials from? Well, the main one was Mayo Flycraft. May Seamus Malarkey. You'd nearly have to get a mortgage to get a genetic cape. So they were all kind <laughs> of, you know, Indian and Chinese, and they, they yeah. were hard work. <laughs> but that's probably how you learn to tie flies to a certain standard now, because the materials that you had then were like the superior now, the stuff you get now. So yeah. it makes life easy to tie flies. But then he only had the, the Indian necks and stuff like that and all different colours and the dyed. Which, which actually, as well, when you're talking there, like, and just as well, you didn't have to go down to size 18s and 20s because, yeah. you know, what was on those Indian and Chinese capes yeah. compared to what we have at genetic capes now? Oh, yeah. You wouldn't yeah. get two or three turns on a dry fly. If you got two, you'd be lucky to get You'd be lucky, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, was, and there was another two guys somewhere down in Tipperary that he was doing stuff, and I don't know. I think they were fond of <laughs> they were fond of the liquor, and that didn't last too long. But they they were bringing stuff in as well. Yeah. And then he had Alice Comba down in Tipperary. If she, she's right. a, I don't know whether she's alive or dead now, Alice, but she was a lovely woman as well. Mm. She does, you know. But she tied commercially. Yeah. She had her own t fly tires, a lot of women tying for her, and everything. it was hard. To, it was hard to get stuff. Tom, to be honest with you, very hard. Even I used to get a lot of farmyard stuff. Lads used to, <laughs> a lad come here one day with two big roosters in the back and, and they were alive. <laughs> they didn't even kill them. They were alive <laughs> in the back. And I had to them? take to a good friend of mine because I couldn't kill him, yeah. Jim Corker, <laughs> a taxidermist. And he did them for me. <laughs> two roosters in, and there were the feathers on them. Were, I still have them actually, two of the, two of yeah. the necks. Some of the air yeah, still have them out there. Now, there's not too many small, but they were really spectacular feathers on them. And Jim Cork and a taxidermist friend of mine, he skinned them for me and gave me the necks off them. And everything. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I try not to take too much stuff in like that because it just destroys everything. If there's mites or anything in it, it destroy yeah, everything yeah, you have. Yeah. So yeah. it's just stuff to be careful with for anybody that's tying flies and doing their own thing like that. Freeze it, put it in a freezer or whatever, but freeze it anyway, kill everything. How long do you freeze it for, actually? I've heard <laughs> different. Until the wife finds it in the freezer. <laughs> <laughs> Just throw my out of the freezer again. <laughs> when I'm defrosting the freezer. Because <laughs> I actually defrosted before Christmas and I found stuff that I didn't even know was in <laughs> Well, that's what, that's how long you leave it in, Tom. <laughs> Fair enough. That's 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 good to know. <laughs> and, the longer the better. And Jimmy, have you any tips for people who are learning fly tying? Maybe really the materials, Dara. To be honest yeah. with you, you know it's it's important. 
it's expensive. The materials are now, and they're going out the, at, the, at the moment. They're going. I'd always recommend to people. I do one-on-one fly tying classes now because of COVID and everything else. So I always recommend if you can get in a group with somebody, you know, even another person to tie flies with, friend, and buy buy a good quality capes and stuff, and split them down the middle. You can buy them in house now anyway because it it is expensive and it kind of puts people. I think even a good saddle now you could pay 70 80 just for an average one 130 140 they've gone they've gone, they've gone yeah they've gone now. they've gone over the 100 oh yeah yeah they've gone ridiculous now ridiculously no it's not materials is the most important thing because it makes it easier for you like when i started i was time flies to make a few quid I started off time for myself for the rivers because you couldn't buy flies around. There was no idea. You could buy them, all right, but they were big bushy things and stuff like that. So that's how I started. Somebody that's getting into fly time, they time most people are time for themselves anyway. And a saddle would last them 20 lifetimes. So I always say if you can get a group of people and divide up stuff, buy it between you, because there is so much in them genetic capes now and stuff. I don't, you can get the Indian stuff, but they're very hard to use. Yeah. Now. I think that's very, a very really hard. good idea. That's a really good idea, Jimmy, because, you know, uh, there is a lot of stuff on the genetic capes, particularly the saddles. And uh, the last, like, for ages, like, I have genetics, genetic capes in there that I have had for over 20 years. And I'm still, I'm still plucking out of them. The same know? as that, Tom, honestly. It's the same as yeah. that. I, I have yeah. stuff there because you wouldn't be using all those feathers. The other tip I was going to give to you, actually, and this is for anybody that's listening as well. Remember when you were saying about blending furs, right? Yeah, yeah. How do you blend with? Uh, by your hands. Right. Yeah, uh, I have. I have tried the coffee blender, right? And I don't like it because it chops it. The yeah. simplest way to to blend. Mm-hmm. You know the little um, aerosol cans you get for cleaning laptops and cleaning. You know the little compressed oh, yeah. air cans. Yeah. Right, you have a little nozzle on them, like a small nozzle on like that. You get a little, you know, the containers you get out of a Chinese, say, for instance. There doesn't yeah. have to be yeah. one of them. You know, the plastic containers. Yeah. Get your, say, you wanted to mix shades of olive, like you wanted to do for, <laughs> for a gym. Yeah, for gym. That time, right? I'll do it for the next one. Mix, <laughs> yeah. Just throw in two little pieces, of the, blend it together a bit so you have a rough idea of what shade it is. Yeah. And then a hole in the side of the thing, put your nozzle in and shh, just give it a shh, a shot with that. And you wouldn't believe how uniformed that comes out. Class. I mean, I mean uniformed. It just breaks it and mixes it together all one colour. You only need a short, a short little shot. Just, of a, it. just a shh, shh. You'll see it rolling around in it. Yeah, it doesn't matter where you place it in the box. Put the stuff in the box, put the lid back on, mm. and I just put a punch a little hole wide enough fit, to so it'll fit the tube from the top of the air. Yeah, so that you know it's not big, just that the nozzle will fit through it. I always just do it with a pair of scissors. Yeah. Point of the scissors, put it in and just and you wouldn't believe you'll get the exact say the colour will be uniform. There won't be a bit of green and a bit of orange and a bit, it'll be the yeah. one it's a great way to blend first together different colors i've heard lads about the coffee grinder and it doesn't that thing just does it in a shh, try it you, oh, go. To, you can get I little go pvc to, cartons as well you know the, yeah once they're airtight yeah punch a hole in and try that it's, it is the best that way for me that's that's how i learned to do it because you know when i was saying to you about i get a lot of flies to copy and things yeah yeah it's very hard to get the right color yeah, it's nearly impossible who, at times. Who are you, te- who are you telling? Yeah, because <laughs> everybody has different. A lot of those boys are tied themselves by the that person. Yeah. They might not yeah. have that shade. Yeah, yeah. So there's a tip for you and people that are listening. It's a great way yeah, to like blend, that. to Excellent. really blend, and you will get it. I swear to God, it, to get the one color. It doesn't. There's no mixture. Just a. If you didn't, just give it another couple of shots, but very little. Amazing, so, amazing. You try that, Jimmy. Have you any? Particular um, favorite flies to tie? I do a lot of river fishing, right? So I like to try and get something that's as near as I can to what's on the water. I've had some good fish that way as well. You know, taking when you see a hatch, of, say olives coming on the wall on the on the wall, but trout are taking them, and you can put everything you have in the boat, and they just won't even look at it. 
because they're just feeding under the surface and you know so mm. i've come up with some nice patterns that way just experimenting taking a few bits home with me and just get a rough idea of of what you've um what's on the water because you have this evenings there you've been out and you won't catch anything they'll just won't even look at it so stuff i i love doing stuff like that i have a few nymph i love tying small nymphs that I don't mean realistic, realistic, but something that just looks the shape of what's on, under the water. Because really, truly, trout, if the trout is going to feed, they'll feed anyway, particularly on the river. I know that the, the locks are completely different. The, a, a trout are in a feeding station. They don't tend to move out of it too often. They might come into it to feed, but they don't, they don't move around too much like they do in the locks. So... It's imitating what's coming down to them, really. And I, I love coming up with my own patterns. I go out there and I probably, I, I, I do a setup that'll do me. I don't have to want to be changed. You know, I you see like now with two rods and I just go yeah. out with one rod, an eight foot, kind of eight foot six, uh, four weight. And I just do a bit. I go out, a bit of nymph fishing first, maybe a little olive nymph and a spider pattern or something like that. And fish away and then, as soon as something starts to happen, just change straight over. Just change the tip it over and put a small dry up. I love that type of fishing. Just uh, fishing's about being relaxed, not because uh, uh, I've, I've I've been out with people and they, they kind of really put too much into it, too much effort into it. To, if you, the fish will feed if you can get them at the right time, and it's just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. A lot of the times. But uh, I love making it easy. And when I take people out teaching, I try and tell them that. Don't, um, you need to bring a suitcase with you to go fishing. Just just, just a, a backpack or a little spray. If you want to go out for the day, put a waistcoat and a backpack on it. Nice and, and a little small light rod. And away you go. And you, you'll get fish. Sounds ideal. And you'll enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Enjoy but it. That's the most important thing. Yeah, yeah, that's it. We kind of forget that's, that's that, it. don't we? Sometimes we get lost yeah. in the mix of it all. Like I always say that it's it is about enjoying it, being relaxed, and just yeah. get out there. And but the more people that get on the rivers, the better. So like what you boys are doing is brilliant, mm. and it's promoting. You know, it is it's promoting it more and more and more. And you, um, we need more stuff like that. You know, yeah. to push people because is this what I said to you? The, the clubs are all closing along the rivers, like because that generation of people are passing. Yeah, we do. We need we need another generation to come through and like we we i've said this so many times now we've discussed this before on the show and there is a problem with younger people coming through but there are efforts been made and there are areas where there are young people coming up and you know but it, you know just work has to be done and continually has to be done to do it you oh, know it's, it's just a matter of keep pushing it yeah, Co yeah. I, I think covid as bad as it was for the world it was pretty good for fishing because it got a lot of people back into fishing mm. I I thought I was I was busier during the COVID, and the, you know I parts of it when people were in lock or well, not necessarily in lockdown, but when they they couldn't go to work and they wanted they had something to get out of the house to do something. Yeah, and I think it brought people back into that. A lot more people seem to have gone back fishing. Mm. Well, hopefully that's the case now, and they'll get their kids to go back into it. Because yeah, the the rivers are getting decimated, Tom, and and the lakes. You, you've seen mm -hmm. up there last. There was somebody up there last year, wasn't there? On Corrib, they caught. I was seeing somebody that lives on them. I think oh, is a God, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and that's going on all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Absolutely crazy. Yeah, a guy caught fishing uh, the day after the season closed. Yeah, yeah. No, but as you say, and like to be honest, yeah, it's what you say. And Dara mentioned on up there as well. The angler is a custodian, Jimmy. Yeah, you know, exactly. and you know. When they're on the river, particularly uh, yep, river or the lake, but particularly a river where I suppose probably a river, it's probably easier to do. Uh, oh, bad, way bad, easier. Bad practices on, yeah, and you know, having having footfall there, having people there watching them, it's yes, yeah. it's, it's really important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the lakes are very hard to. How do you control vast areas? A river, you can see a car, you can see, you know, you'll always yeah. be aware of what's around you, but. On, a, on, on the locks is a completely different story. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's where you have your work out. But hey, listen, all we can do is keep 
promoting fishing and promoting fishing and hopefully I ain't gone past the stage where I, I, I love to get people out in the river now, but it's not, for me, it's, it's not a financial thing because I'm retired now. All my, the kids are red. It's only me, the wife and the dog here. So it's really, I'm enjoying it. As I said, I, I enjoy it now. Yeah. Well, I think that's really important what you said as well, just back to the fishing, you know, that you've got to enjoy it. You know, don't get too uptight about it. Just enjoy it. And, as you said, Dar, it's got to be a bit of fun. Yeah. And got, sometimes, it, you know, just remember that. That's yes. what it is. It's enjoyable. It's <laughs> yeah. a bit of fun. <laughs> just think back of how many blank nights you've had or blank days you've had. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. But it's still enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's what it's all about. From. Yeah. Well, Jimmy, um, it's been fascinating talking to you, finding out a bit more about um, the local livers. But we have one more question for you. And it is... What has been your most memorable fish on the fly? I can go back to, to actually to something that we were just talking about in and making the fly to catch a fish. It there was a on the on the river gowl, right? And th- this actually, I, I don't fish competitions, right? Never, I, I don't think of it. I fish one, and this fish was involved in this, right? And it, it comes back to that uh, a certain fly, a little blue-winged olive emerger, right, that I made up through a bit of research and looking at things, and, and and it was tiny, but it was nothing to it, a bit of CDC and just a little plump body on it. And a, a bit of, uh, I think there was two strands of cocktail for the tail, but it was a little emerger. And there was, I always remember these trout, <laughs> there was two of them, and they were in a big pool on the Yorkton on a bend, and they were feeding non-stop. And there was only two of them in it, but they were feeding all the time. And I was fishing this competition, and I was sorry that I went up there, but I went up to catch a fish, and I caught this fish. It was about, definitely, it was two and a quarter pounds, right? And this is why, it was not the biggest fish I ever caught, but it's the most memorable, because it took me an age to get it in. And I had to kill it, right, for the competition. There was no measuring, no nothing. And that really brought me hard because I the river gowl, I just love it. I know every stone in it, and I never yeah. take it out of it. But the other fish, right, that was <laughs> was still – when I got this fish out, because it didn't jump, it just was going around the pool, and I got it out, knocked it on the head, and the other one was still feeding away. And I stayed, and I, got, I same fly, and this is God's honest truth. It was two and three quarters pound weight, right? Yeah. It was a oh, it was a, a really, really beautiful fish. But that went back in. But it took <laughs> hard to kill that other one, and that's why that's the most memorable because fish like that, you know, two. I think it was just over two and just under the two and a half pound. But to kill a fish like that. It, you know, I didn't like doing it, and it won the competition by I say the nearest thing to it was probably about a pound weight, yeah, and, and that was on the Nore or on the Urkner actually, and it brought me hard to kill that fish, but I did anyway, and we ate it, but <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm not, hey, don't get me wrong, people should go out and that's what they're there for to eat them, but for me. When you have a little river like that and you're trying to mind it and you have to, you know, luckily enough, I was the only one that went up there and fished that. I knew where these fish were anyway. So, but uh, I never fished a competition after that, ever. <laughs> and I, and I won't. Was it, <laughs> yeah, you're a bit dumb. I've had some great memories on, of, of fishing now, but that was the one because I was out on my own. There was nobody with me and I got that. I had to take it into the way and, and then want to see what comes. But that was probably the most memorable fish for me because there was two of them side by side and they were just feeding away there. And it was it was really moonlit night, super. And but that was one of the best nice fishing I've ever had. But I had to knock that fish on the head. That that's why I always remember it. <laughs> bittersweet for well, you, Jimmy. Di- bittersweet. Bittersweet is right. Yeah, you're doing it justice by remembering it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah. Well, Jimmy, um, irishflycraft.com is the website, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, uh, irishflycraft.com. Everything there from salmon flies, even pike flies. Yeah, I, I know. yeah, tie everything really right across the board, yeah. Yeah, so definitely. The only thing I don't like tying is lures and things like that much because there's too much mess with them. But I'd rather have mock flies than river flies. And, but I tie everything across the board for all, doesn't it? But there's everything on the website anyway. So Brilliant. Well, we'd highly recommend people check it out for the flies, the Ooh. guiding, the instruction. Jimmy's retired now. He's loads of time in his hands. Yeah, and I'd be up in the morning time. So <laughs> to get up to the pit. Brilliant. But, well, listen, May tight. Hey, well, the sun shines. Tight lines for this season, anyway, Jimmy. And um, you, too, you, Dara. you hey, never know. Hopefully, we'll, I'll be hoping the two of you this year. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. All you're, yeah. you're passing through. Mm. I'll show you where the museum is. Brilliant. I'll give that yeah, a little Jimmy, thanks for your time. Okay, lovely talking to you, boys. Our thanks to Jimmy Turrell for joining us on the show. Don't forget to rate, review, and follow the Ireland on the Fly podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Plus, you can keep up to date on IrelandOnTheFly.com as well as on Instagram. And myself and Tom will be back with another episode about the people and places of fly fishing in Ireland. Starting with our first Masterclass live webinar on Thursday, March 14th, international angler and lock carb expert Mike Keady will be explaining early season buzzer tactics. What's the setup? What flies to use? And how to maximise your catch rates? All of this and more. Mike Keady will be explaining. Plus, he will then be answering your questions live during the webinar. And if that's not enough, every attendee will get a copy of Mike's detailed notes and have exclusive access to the recording of the webinar afterwards. And for all of this, tickets to the webinar are just €10. To attend, you must register and pay in advance by going to irelandonthefly.com forward slash masterclass.